Hi, everyone. Welcome to Conscious Living Radio. I'm Tasha Sims. And I'm Mark Curran. And of course, we're live on Facebook today. And then you can hear the audio of the show on FM 100.5 in Vancouver Co-op Radio. Uh, Conscious Living is the name of the show. And then later available as a podcast on www.consciouslivingnetwork. No, that's wrong. Clearly, I have a concussion. (laughs) And I do. Um, and I was trying to hide it. So see, I'm just not allowed to do that. I was, um, I'm going to tell them about it instead. I was on set shooting a movie last week, 10 days ago, and um, fell and broke my shoulder and hit my head. And it's oh, like, no. wow, this is, a, it's really interesting timing. I must say, everything that needs to be broken is being broken. Oh, God. Yeah. So All our right. guest... Yeah, I applaud you. I I applaud you, Tasha, for for being here. uh, All things considered, so thanks for uh, stepping up and still doing what you do so well. But I couldn't fake it. Is I lasted ten seconds there trying to behave like a normal person (laughs) without telling the truth. Uh, Just be yourself. (laughs) Well, that's it. That's what came through. Anyway, I'm very very excited about today's show. Um, Our guest is filmmaker, author Lionel. Friedberg. He's an Emmy award-winning film and television producer, a writer. He grew up in South Africa, began his career at the first TV station in Central Africa in northern Rhodesia, which is now Zambia, back in 61. He worked as a director of photography on 18 feature films, wrote, produced, directed for National Geographic, PBS, and National Broadcast, the Discovery Channel, A&E, the History Channel. He's also a New York Times bestselling author and currently based in Los Angeles. So he's written a book called Forever in My Bains, How Film Led Me to the Mysterious World of the African Shaman. And that's our focus today. So we're going to talk about not only the predictions that were foretold by African healers that came to pass in his life, but also how his experiences led him to understand that we're all metaphysically connected. And and for me, very importantly, how that knowledge, the practice of that um, is relevant and helpful in today's world. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a great pleasure to be here, Tasha. Thank you so much. So great to have you. And, uh, you know, as I was telling you before we started, I was so deeply moved by your book and impacted I highly recommend it uh, for people to read. Each chapter was like a different landscape, both of people and places and revelations. Like it was so deep from your roots as a kid in apartheid in South Africa to the bush, to the indigenous traditions, to, oh, the horrors of trophy hunting, um, to the white nothingness of Antarctica. And then, of course, we'll get to it later in the show, your mind-blowing interview with Adolf Hitler's personal pilot. It's like, are you kidding me? So, (laughs) yeah, the book was uh, engrossing from page one, and I felt had a kind of magic, but it was also full of an illumination of some of the incredible injustice or man's inhumanity as well, which which deeply, deeply uh, touched me. So... How about we start with what was your intention when you first started writing Forever in My Veins? Well, I I don't want to sound boastful or arrogant in any way whatsoever, because that was not my motive. But, you know, I really have been blessed with an extraordinary life. And um, I was in the film industry for almost 60 years, and I've worked on every continent of the planet. And I've probably made films about every topic you can think of, um, um, from, um, you know, with, with NASA, the Voyager spacecraft mission to the outer planets, ethnographic filmmaking. I've spent time uh, on desert islands doing films about the biosystems. I've done science. I've done all kinds of things. So I'm just throwing these little uh, you know, this, the things out because it's been so varied and so extraordinary. And I met so many amazing people during this incredible journey that I felt it unfair to not, uh, unfair to not share this with the world. I wanted to um, share a little bit of my life and a little bit of how amazing I have found the world to be in its diversity <clears throat> and in its complexity and in all the wonders that one encounters almost every single day, um, I just wanted to share that with, with, with people. And the, the title really refers to the fact that I'm an African. 
I was born in Africa, which is a fascinating continent. You were telling me earlier before we went on the air that your mother spent part of her childhood there. And um, I uh, and I totally, totally, totally understand what you were referring to when you were saying, you know, that it affected her deeply because Africa has that power. It has an, an, an incredible ability to to impact on people, to 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 leave an, an impression on people. Even if folks go out there for a, a quick safari, you know, in Tanzania or go on an expensive uh, visit to various countries in Africa, they all come away changed mm -hmm. they all come away with a new perspective of the world because it's nature in the raw on a massive scale and it, the drama of life and nature and all this diversity plays out every single day in front of you so it's an it's an incredible com uh, continent you know they speak something like a, a thousand different languages and uh the people there are extraordinarily diverse and i just wanted to um you know, get in, into the essence of the title of the book that said that all of that remains with me. I'm as white as they can, as, as, you, as you can get, but Africa courses through my veins to this day. And uh, it defines me. It defines who I am. And it certainly defines who I am as a filmmaker and as a person who has, if I may say so, uh, an inquiring mind. I want to know what goes on. If I meet somebody or I'm given a topic, <clears throat> no matter what the subject may be, I really want to get to the kernel of the thing, right down to the very roots of what it's all about. And it's Africa that's given me that drive. So uh, that's what the title is all about. And that's why I wanted to share this with the world, with you, with everybody. Mm -hmm. you know? I love it. And so I wonder, let me ask you about this theme that coursed through me reading your book, but then I realized it also courses through me it was coursing through me before I read your book. So what it did was highlight um, this theme of how power over. So whether it's man over woman or man over animal or one race over another race, but inherently the model of one being over another or over nature for that matter, power mm. over is inherently from in my body wrong. Like that's mm -hmm. all I can land in without a lot of story. Yeah. And as I read your book, I felt that at every turn, it was like, it, it was an illumination of the, that kept asking me what was being awoken in me is who am I as a human being? Who are we? What are human beings? Right. And so I wonder if, was that something that, is that something that resonates for you? Or was I just interpreting it through my lens? No, it's a constant drive uh, behind me all the time. I, I, exactly what you've been saying and what you've been asking yourself is what I've been asking myself ever since I was a child. Um, you know, uh, although we may be the dominant species on this planet, are we being responsible dominant species? Um, and, you know, for example, growing up as a child in South Africa during the, the, the heydays of apartheid in all its ugliness, you know, I was witness to all of that. You'd go down the road and uh, a black nanny would be wheeling a white child in a stroller or a pram or whatever you want to call it. And, and, and a van would arrive and stop this person and say, do you have your passbook? And if this poor woman did not have her identity documents on her at that time, she would be thrown in the van and arrested for not being there legally. That's how awful it was. There were separate beaches, separate entrances, separate everything for everybody. Uh, the twain never met between black and white. Uh, the only way you would ever get to know a black person is because they were a servant in your home uh, or someone who you know, packed uh, cases and, and stores and shelves um, in, in, in a shop. You knew nothing about those people. And uh, it, it, it just felt, felt, felt terribly, terribly wrong to me. And uh, in actual fact, that's what really drove my parents away from South Africa. My father was originally an emigrant from Latvia, would you believe? He went, he emigrated to what was then German Southwest Africa in the 20s. Um, and he, he, he learned his trade uh, as a watchmaker in, um, in, 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 in Riga. 
and uh, he went to German Southwest Africa, which eventually became known as Southwest Africa. It was a mandated territory under South Africa after World War II, uh, and then eventually became the Republic of Namibia, which is what it's known as today. And he went there, and he eventually moved to South Africa, where he met my mother. Uh, and my father found this whole apartheid situation pretty abominable. Uh, he really didn't like it at all. He was very uncomfortable with it all the time. And, you know, I was an only child, and I would often go home and say, what I saw, I was going down the road and there was a gardener mowing the lawn and a van pulled up and they asked the man for his papers and he didn't have them and they threw him in the van and they drove away with him. Why did they do that? You know, and they would say, shh, 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 don't talk about that. Don't ask questions like that. We're not supposed to discuss it. It's not allowed to discuss things like that. That's the kind of society I lived in. And so right from the get-go, I knew that there was something inherently wrong about that and that one would have you know, um, sway over another just seemed inherently wrong. Um, and in South Africa, it, not only was it uh, unlike what still goes on here in the United States, unfortunately, where racism is, is alive and well, um, but in South Africa, it was the law. It was enshrined mm -hmm. in the statute books. Right. You know, the train could not meet. And if you went to a building or you went to a whatever it was, there would be separate entrances. You could not sit together. You could not meet. You could not marry. You could not have black friends. It was just not acceptable because it was illegal. It just felt so horribly wrong. And I think that that's what gave me this first awareness of the fact that, you know, I questioned everything. Um, are we dealing with one another correctly? Are we dealing with the world we live on correctly? Are we dealing with our fellow beings correctly? And, and here's the thing that I care very, very deeply about. I think that as the dominant species, as I, as I said earlier, the way we treat the non-human world is absolutely abhorrent today, particularly with the, uh, the, 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 the industrialized agriculture on the massive scale on which it exists today just seems to me to be so un, unbelievably um, almost evil in a way. It's yeah. all about profit and it's all about, you know, the, the, these poor commodities, these, these animals are commodities, they're numbers. They're not, they're not sentient feeling beings. And uh, that just seems very wrong to me. So all of this keeps inspiring me all the time. And so can we enter that for a moment? Because, you know, I honestly, your trophy hunting chapter, when I tell people about it and talk about it, that's all I'm doing. And this has been, you know, I read that part three weeks ago. I literally cannot hold back tears. Even bringing it up right now, I want to cry. Mm -hmm. It is the most, there was, uh, and I'd love it in your words, but the part that impacted me was your, your filming for, you know, three Hollywood dudes who are wanting to bag some elephants. Right. But the fact that the elephants allowed you to live, and then yeah. the, the whole thing that happens after that just hits a chord in my heart that is beyond mm. my ability mm. to hold without welling up. Anyway, I want to direct you and maybe share that story with the listeners, and then we can ask some questions about it. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, the incident that you're referring to was actually predicted by a, a very, very old woman in Zambia many, many, many years ago. Uh, she predicted just about everything that came true in my life. At the time when she made these predictions, um, I had no idea what they meant because she was almost talking in riddles. She was, she was seeing visions. And she was merely describing what she was seeing. I don't think she fully understood what she was seeing in a little mud hut on the edge of a village in the middle of Zambia. Uh, but one of the things she did describe to me was, be very careful of the great beast because it might kill you. And I had no idea what that was about until 1967 when I took this job as a cameraman to cover the safari, uh, a very wealthy uh, a safari. It was, you know, well funded, and it had every bell and whistle, and you know, portable refrigerators and martinis uh, um, were, mm -hmm. were carried everywhere. It was unbelievable. And um, when these three hunters arrived from LA um, at the city of Byra, um, you know, they started unloading their equipment from the aircraft, and it was like they came to fight a war. There were all these telescopic sights and guns and ammunition. You know, it, it was unbelievable. I couldn't believe this. The reason I took the assignment was I never understood what made, what was the reason, where was the fun in hunting? 
how did people derive any degree of fun out of killing innocent animals? It made no sense to me whatsoever. And so I wanted to find out what that was all about, which is why I took the job. And uh, during the course of the making of this film came the day where we had to, uh, the, the one hunter, it was his turn to shoot an elephant. And um, he shot at a herd and uh, the, the elephant that was selected to be shot was pointed out to him by the white hunter who led the safari, said, that's your guy over there on the right hand side, he's an old bull, he's to the edge of the, tro he's to the, edge of the herd, he's lost his place, he's no longer the head honcho, you can take him, take him out not kill him, you know, take him out, you know, a nice polite term. Anyway, the guy shot and missed and the, the herd stampeded. They went absolutely crazy. And I was right behind him. This is the hunter who, who fired the shot. I was right behind him with my camera, hoping to get a shot of him in the foreground and then the elephant in the background, you know, dropping down to its knees. Um, but that's not what happened because he missed. And as these elephants all dissipated in this cloud of dust in every direction, what was left behind was one single female elephant and her baby calf in the middle of this herd. And she knew what gunfire meant. And she knew that her baby was threatened. And so she decided to stampede. She wanted to kill the hunter. And he was right in front of me, in front of my camera. And she started to run towards him. She left her baby and she started just running at full whack towards him. And the, the ground was shaking. It was absolutely thunderous. Uh, and all I could hear in the background were the white hunters saying, get out the way, get out the way, get out the way. But I was rooted to the spot. I could not move. And all I could see in my viewfinder was this elephant getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And, bigger. and then the hunter in front of me, he ran out of the shot and I was alone. And this elephant couldn't stop herself. She would have, she would have hit, come straight towards me and she would have killed me as that woman had foretold in her predictions years mm -hmm. ago. And at the very, very last minute, she must have been maybe six or eight feet away from me. I heard bam over my shoulder and the white hunter shot her right between the eyes here. And she dropped onto her, her front legs crumbled. And then she fell onto her side and her eyes were locked with mine. And we had an extraordinary somehow or another I still to this day don't really understand what happened but there was a connection made at that during her dying phase as this poor creature was dying she and I made this incredible spiritual connection I know it happened I felt it and then she eventually her eyes glazed over and she died I was trembling not so much with fear as as I was with sheer horror as to what had happened and I knew that something had, had happened that day with that creature and I. So we cut to the evening. We're back in base camp that night. Everybody's drinking away and having a wonderful time and talking about the stories of what happened during the day. And I'm sitting on my own at the edge and I was thinking about it. And I said, you know, you could have been killed today. And it's, I suddenly thought back to what that old woman had predicted. She foresaw this. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that as a realization was, it, it struck me like a bolt of lightning. How did she see this? Um, but I felt that that elephant had not left me. She was still with me. And that's what, 50, 60 years ago? That elephant is still with me to this day. I know she is, her spirit is still around me. And I'll tell you why. I have been back to see many, many uh, shamans back in Africa for various reasons, either during filming or when I developed this autoimmune disorder some years ago, I went back to seek help because I wasn't getting any better on Western allopathic medicine here in LA where you have the, the latest and the best of everything, but you know, I wasn't getting any better. And I went back to Africa to see if one of these, uh, if the shamans there could be of any help to me. And I saw a number of them out in the middle of the boondocks. I mean, we're not talking about urban areas in Johannesburg or whatever. These are out in the sticks. <clears throat> and the modality that they use is they throw bones and they interpret the way these bones fall on a grass mat. If a bone is upside down or one bone falls on top of the other, it all means something. And each Sangoma interprets it according to his or her understanding of the way these bones fall. And the belief is that it is the ancestors, the patient, me, the person asking the question, or who has come for consultation, 
my ancestors are influencing away those the way those mm -hmm. bones fall these are small bones not big they're small ones you know from a goat uh, a little bone from a from a from a lion a knuckle um, there's a goat there, uh, an, a, a bone from a crocodile a hyena and a few other creatures and then they add their own bits and pieces to it to this to their set and um, without any without exception every time the Sangoma threw the bones to try and analyze my condition or what was wrong with me. The very, very first thing, without exception, that they all said to me was, they used to clap their hands and they used to say, what is this elephant with you? We see an Ndlovu, and Ndlovu is a Zulu word for elephant. They all saw this elephant spirit in my bones with me. You know, so I know that this being is with me. We are all, as we were talking uh, um, off the cuff before the, 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 we started recording the show, we're all connected to this, un, the, whatever it may be, there's an invisible grid that exists, uh, a field, uh, call it what you like. We are all interconnected to that. And that elephant and I are very much part and parcel of the same world. We, 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 we are sharing my life together. And I believe that her spirit is protecting me. And, and I know it sounds, I, it, sounds, it, it sounds crazy. It doesn't uh, to us at all. It sounds <laughs> uh, absolutely real. But my question is, because I love to get to the root of things too, yeah. is how you interpret it as protective. Because here you are, you're part of a group of people attacking these innocent animals yes how does this animal take you know in that moment where she is threatened and her young one is being threatened how does the connection with you become protective for you because i'm absolutely certain of the fact that she knew that i was not the one who fired the gun right i was not the one threatening her baby and right. i think she felt probably my emotions i felt extraordinary sorry for her i felt my my heart was going out to this poor creature mm -hmm. uh, but when she started to to thunder towards me i was yeah. filled with fear i think she realized that and i think in her dying moments she 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 was aware of the fact that this was my emotions right. and so and so we bonded right and this happened after the herd that had circled you can you just add that part of the story to yeah. the mix because that for yes. me it was the, the fact that elephants mm. were so kind yes yes in in their consideration of these human beings who then become uh, such yeah yeah uh, the, the one guy whose turn it was to shoot the elephant uh he was absolutely insistent on getting his elephant on this particular day out so we we, we, we had open vehicles um jeep jeep like vehicles and then there was a truck behind us that used to take the dead animals back to the camp you know where the uh, where where the the skins and the horns were processed for trophies to be sent home but anyway um we had tracked this elephant herd and he was absolutely insistent on getting his elephant this particular day and we we kept following the herd for hours and hours and hours and hours they kept getting away from us and at the end of the day wally who was the guy who ran the safari he said, you know, guys, uh, we better leave the vehicles here and start following them on foot because we're not going to catch up with them. They, they know we're after them. And so we started walking. And by the time we had walked for three or four hours, the sun was going down. And so we, we, we had to spend the night in the bush. We had no sleeping equipment. We had no food. We had very little water with us. And we, the, the hunters, myself, the guy who was assigned to me as my battery carrier for my camera, those were the days of film, a huge, big, wet cell battery that this guy had to carry to power my camera. And, and the trackers, we all huddled together in a little group under a, a Mopani tree. This was in Mozambique, uh, in, a, in an area called Zinav, rich with wildlife, absolutely rich with wildlife. Today, it's all gone uh, because of the civil war. Nevertheless, um, and we were all huddled together. There was no moon that night. It was the night was absolutely pitch black. Um, and around about two o'clock in the morning, Wally, the leader of the expedition, he, he leant over to us and he said, don't move. And we all said, why? And he said, because the herd has come back. They have found us and they have encircled us. And, you know, the, one of the, uh, the Americans said, why? Why would they do that? And he said, because they don't want us to kill them. They are here to warn us. They could kill us as, like that, just trample us to death. 
I can't shoot the dark, can't see a damn thing, you know. Um, they know that. They are here to tell us to please leave them in peace. And I really believe that he was right because you could hear the rumbling of their hearts. You could hear the switching of, switching of their ears in the darkness. You couldn't see them, but you knew they were there. And every now and again, you could catch a little bit of a glint of light in, in an eye here and there. They completely surrounded us. And as the dawn started to arrive, they began disappearing into the bush and they left, left us alone. And, 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 and when the morning began, Wally got up and he said, those animals came to warn us last night. They came to ask us to leave them in peace. That's why they were here. And I believe he was absolutely right. And yet we still pursued them and we still tried to kill them. And that was the result of this uh, uh, incident, you know, that this poor yeah. cow lost her life. Uh, I don't know what happened to her baby. Her baby was probably adopted by another uh, one of the females or a couple of females. Elephants are very, very social creatures. They are very wise creatures. If you've ever looked, there are a number of things that I've learned over the years making natural history films. If you look into the eye of an elephant or the eye of a whale, or even the eye of an octopus, all you are seeing is, is wisdom. There is depth there. There is sentience there that goes yeah. deeper than we can ever imagine. And let's move into the realm of the metaphysical because it's fundamental to Africa, um, this understanding that ancestral spirits influence a person you know, all the time and all the spiritual dimensions. I mean, it's, it's just such a deep part of, of being. Yeah. Do you think, well, first of all, what, what about all those experiences you had most impacted you and woke you up to this realm of um, that we're all interconnected and that there's, you know, your ancestors are, are involved mm. in your life and, and the whole magic of it. That's part one. And part two is, is that important for everyone to begin to understand in Western society? Would that make a difference in how we're treating the world and each other? If that, if we could begin to open all of us to yeah. a real knowing that it, none of it's crazy. It's just not a plus B equals C it's something yeah, else. Yeah, it's a yeah. different energy and language. Yeah. I hear you. I hear you loud and clear. And I think, the greatest tragedy is that we in the West uh, have lost touch with nature. Uh, we no longer have a connection with the natural world. Um, kids are, you know, they're, they're completely stuck to their little electronic tablets and their phones. Uh, they have no idea what it's like to go out into the wilderness. And I, I keep saying, even to my, to my own children and their grandchildren, I keep saying, Unplug all those ghastly devices. Let the batteries run down. Put them away. Take the kids on a camping trip. Take them on a canoe down a river. Take them climbing up a mountain. Let them feel the leaves and smell the bush and smell the trees. Let them reconnect with nature. That's what it's all about. We've lost touch with that. And until we regain our respect for the natural world, I don't think we'll ever get a full understanding or be at peace with it, with, 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 with our, at anything outside of our Western society and our cities and our freeways, I don't think we stand a chance of ever making peace with anything beyond that because we've lost that connection. And uh, I think it's absolutely vital that we do that. I wish it was part of the educational system. Mm -hmm. I wish it was mandatory that kids right from the beginning would go out into nature and, you know, not just go to a petting farm, but regularly go out on camping trips and going out into the wilderness and spending time in the wilderness and looking at the stars and seeing the scope and just sensing something about the vastness of the cosmos in which we live and smelling the way the earth smells after a rain, you know, uh, we don't do that. And I think it's absolutely essential that we do. But in answer to your question uh, about how did it happen with me, I was very fortunate. I was, um, and I did write about this in the book. I many, many years ago, I was working at a film studio in Johannesburg, and uh, we had um, we had a guy uh, on the lot who was a film editor, and he was a satsangi. He followed the satsangi path, 
And I didn't quite understand what all that was about. But nevertheless, one day he said, come on, let's go up. Well, let's go and have lunch together. And I said, sure. And we went up to uh, a steakhouse up the road. And uh, this was 1960, probably 1964. And uh, I ordered my usual hamburger and fries and, you know, a salad. And he ordered fries and a salad and a baked potato. And I said, you're not having any burger or meat? He said, no. And he said, have you ever thought what that is when the, when that arrives on your plate have you ever given it any thought as to what th that chunk of flesh really is and it suddenly hit me like a ton of bricks between my eyes and i thought oh my god right. i realized this was once a living creature it had feelings it had a face it had a family yeah and i was never really i'd never really given that serious thought and it was due to this guy, and I'm going to say his name because bless his soul, Bill Pullen was his name. He's now moved on to other pastures. But thank God for Bill. He made me aware of the fact, you know, uh, that animals are not commodities and they're not just chunks of brown things covered in gravy on a plate. They're living beings um with emotions and with uh, feelings and with hopes and with aspirations and i never thought about that before yeah <sighs> and and i think about it all the time and uh, not go ahead mark well so then my question lionel <clears throat> because it's uh, i i just love what you're talking about it and what you're sharing because of my own you know spiritual awakening and that um <clears throat> and the value for animals as sentient beings did that uh, inspire you to become vegetarian or did that change your life in a different way? It, I became a vegetarian instantly that day, that day. Um, it took a while for me to wean myself off the, uh, the cheese and it took a while for me to wean myself off dairy. But that was the end of it. No fish, no poultry, no meat ever again after that day. And that's what, 1964 is a long time ago. Um, and about 15 years ago, I became 100% vegan. I don't even wear leather. I mean, my belt is not made of leather. My, my shoes are not made of leather. I absolutely do not want to in any way live a life that in any way inflicts or impinges or impacts on the animal world. I, don't, I, I just can't be a part of that. I just couldn't live with it. Beautifully said. Thank so you. I'm going to do a not terribly graceful segue all the way to, because your book is so filled with things that are, like I say, each chapter feels like a whole other world that I'm entering. So the one I want to enter next, if you're okay with it, is Hitler. And, you know, yes, it's part of my roots, but it's also, um, I think, incredibly relevant. What happened in Germany is so relevant to today, I cannot stop thinking about it. Yeah. And I'm hoping that you'll tell your story and we can weave it into today's consciousness and what we need to wake up to to make sure it doesn't happen again. Yeah. So let's start with the story because I know at the beginning, you, to you, this was an interview that you were filming, but it had nothing to do with Hitler at the beginning, right? Yeah, correct. Go ahead. Um, well, first of all, the way it came about was very, very strange. And once again, I go back to my first experience with that very, very first um, shaman who went by the name of uh, Nganga. This was in Zambia. By the way, the reason I went to see this woman was I was working for Northern Rhodesia Television. That was the first television station in Central Africa. That was my first job. Uh, it was absolutely extraordinary. It was amazing. And after three years, Northern Rhodesia was given its independence by Britain. And Northern Rhodesia then became the Republic of Zambia. And when that happened, the government took over the station. It was privately owned, but they took over the station. And all of us uh, white members of staff, we all got little pink slips to say, thank you very much. You've done a great job, but goodbye. goodbye. In six, six months time, <laughs> you, you know, yeah. that's it. Bye bye, baby. Uh, well, I, we all understood that it was now an independent country and that's the way it should have been. Uh, these people had never been given these opportunities before. Now it was their turn. So most of the people could return back to the UK, which is where they came from, um, and continue their, their, their careers. But I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. This was my first job. You know, and I thought, what am I going to do with, with myself? So we had a very, very nice young man who was working for us. Uh, at home. He was a member of the Bemba ethnic group. 
And uh, the next morning, I went to him and I said, David, a terrible thing has happened. He said, oh, what? I said, well, yesterday I was fired. He said, what? You were fired. Why? I said, well, because the station has been taken over by the government and they're going to give my job to someone like you, um, which is fine. And I, I'm, 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 I'm okay with that. But what am I going to do with my life? And he said, oh, my goodness. He said, well, let me think about it for a day or so. Now, I had an option. I could go back to South Africa, which is where we had come from after my, my parents had emigrated from there. But, you know, apartheid was still alive and well. I did not want to go back to South Africa. It had a pretty thriving film industry and a good one at that, by the way. Uh, I could have gone back there, but what I really wanted to do was to come to North America, either to work um, uh, in the ideal world, you know, here in Los Angeles, which is where I live now. Um, but the Americans were not giving away visas those days to white South Africans because of the apartheid system. However, I went to the Canadian embassy and the Canadians were absolutely amazing. And they said, sure, give us your passport. And in two weeks, I had a visa, an immigrant visa, and I emigrated to Canada. So um, that's how it came about. But I did not know that that's how it was going to play out. So I wanted to know what my future, what, what the future would hold for me. So I said to David, I don't know what to do. And he said, let me, let me find someone who may be able to help you. And uh, I said, OK. I had no idea what he was referring to, no idea at all. And on whatever day it was, Thursday or Tuesday or whatever, it was his day off and was my day off. And there we were trundling along in my little secondhand car through the bush to a little tiny village on the outskirts of town. And on the edge of that village was a little hut. And in this hut lived this little old Bemba woman. She answered the door. She spoke no English at all. And she answered the door and she welcomed us into her house and she sat us down. And she had a grass mat on her floor. And on this grass mat was a little bag, an animal skin bag. And she picked it up and she shook it like this. And I could hear clink, 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 clink. And she said, say your name into the bag, which is what I did. And then she turned the bag upside down and all these bones fell onto the mat. And in Bemba, she just came out with all of these statements nonstop. It was like a tirade. It just flowed out of her. And David did his best to try and keep up with her. And I was doing my best trying to make notes of what he was telling me, what he was translating. And one of the things she said to me was, um, you know, he will, he will cross, he will cross the, 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 the great water. He will, he will go over the great water to, the, to that direction. And she points to the north, not knowing, I'm sure, what she was, even be, what she was referring to. But he will go in that direction across the great water. Now, remember, Zambia is a landlocked country. There's no ocean there. She probably never been more than 20 miles away from, from the house, where she, little hut where she was born. Um, but she could foresee this. And, you know, it came to pass. I eventually emigrated in those days. You didn't go by air. You went by sea. And so I traveled from Cape Town to Southampton. It was a two-week journey. And halfway through the journey, probably day seven or eight, I went up to the top deck of the ship one night and I looked at the sky because every night the sky changed. You could see the constellations moving across the sky. Every night they had changed their pattern. They changed their position. And I realized one particular night that my God, I am going from one hemisphere of the planet to another. Not only that, but I'm also traveling on the big water. I'm traveling on the Atlantic Ocean. She foresaw that as well. And so, you know, that prediction came true. And so that's how I ended up eventually uh, in, 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 in Canada. And um, I've, I've, I think I've, I've lost my thought train, but you were We're going in. back to Hitler. Yeah, right. So I, she told me a number of things. She told me about crossing the big water. She told me about going to a world where there, there was no color, where everything was all white. She told me about this great beast that would always kill me in the jungle, which is what that elephant story was. She told me that I would one day make a film on the great water and the great water would try to take my life. And it's true, I was an icebreaker on an icebreaker which almost capsized in the South Atlantic. All of this she saw uh, in the bones. But one of the strangest things she told me that afternoon in a little mud hut in Central Africa was, one day in his work, 
he will go and he will meet a man who knew the most evil man who ever lived. And when I heard this, I thought, what on earth is she referring to? Now, remember, we're talking about the year 1964. We jump ahead in time to the year 1983. And I'm doing a series of films on the history of South African Airways. Now, South African Airways has a very, very interesting, it goes right back to 1929. And in the course of researching this film, the, the, the series of films, um, sorry, let me just uh, get rid of this. Uh, in, the, in, in the course of researching the film, we found out that in 1934, the airline bought three new German aircraft from a company called Junkers in Germany. And they had to get flown all the way from, I think it was uh, either uh, um, Bremen or a large German city, had to be flown all the way from Germany to Johannesburg. Now that's, that's, that's an enormous trip down the whole of the length of Africa. No navigational aids, no alternative airports, very few airfields of, to talk, talk about anyway. So the ex, just the flight itself was a major, major story. And when I heard that, I thought, wow, I've got to interview this pilot, uh, if he's still alive, one of these pilots who flew this, this route. So we did a lot of research. And one day, my, my researcher, bless her soul, Esme uh, Jacobson, she came along and she says, guess what? One of the pilots who flew one of those ferry flights from the factory to Johannesburg, he's still alive. And he's in his late 80s. I think he was like 88 or 89. And he has agreed to be interviewed for the film. And I thought, oh, my God, that's incredible. This has got to go into the movie. So with the help of the German government, uh, this is before East and West Germany had combined. So the government was still based in Bonn. We called him the man from Bonn. Um, and uh, so Bonn arrived, uh, this guy from uh, Bonn arrived uh, to meet us in Frankfurt. Uh, and um, we all met there and uh, we, you know, we were preparing to go and interview this pilot. He actually lived in a small town just to the west of uh, Munich in Bavaria. And um, the, the reason why we were in Frankfurt is because this guy was also an amateur cinematographer. This is back in 1933, 34. And he had filmed that delivery flight, would you believe? Hippos on the airfield and, you know, black men in their, in their tribal regalia pumping paraffin into wings of aircraft. I mean, it was amazing footage. It's, it's worth gold. And so th this film still existed in a lab in Frankfurt. So that's why we were in Frankfurt. And I went there, I chose the shots that I wanted for the film. And then it was time to go and interview the pilot. Now, from Frankfurt to Munich is quite a drive. But on the Autobahn, it's very easy because there's no mm -hmm. speed limit. And you just go whack. You know, straight road down, down, down to, down to Munich. And the man from Bonn accompanied us because he was the one who facilitated this entire interview, you know. And um, so there was a large crew. There was my, my film crew. There was a, a stills crew. There were some publicity people and whatever else and two vehicles. And the night before we did the interview, we stayed at a tiny little hotel in a little place called Amashi, uh, which is near where this man lived. His name was Hans Barr. B-A-U-R. That's all I knew about him. And uh, I was very eager to, you know, to conduct this interview. He spoke no English. My German was not good enough for me to, uh, to uh, hold a conversation. So the man from Bonn was, was designated as my interpreter. And at about uh, after dinner that night, we started uh, drinking some very good Rhine wine and, you know, having some schnutz, schnapps and schnitzel and, you know, whatever else. And the man from Bonn sort of sidled up to me gently during the course of the evening. And at about midnight, he calls, looks over the top of his glass and he said to me, uh, you know, Herr Friedberg, how much do you really know about Kapitan Bar? And I said, well, what is, else is there to know other than the fact that he flew that delivery flight of an airliner, which only held about 14 people, but it was the latest airliner of its type in the world. And um, I said, you know, what else is there to know? And he said, well, you know, there was a war. And I said, yes, I know there was a war. And I could figure out, well, if, if he did that delivery flight mm -hmm. in 1934, he must have been a pilot with a Luftwaffe. So I said, well, I, I, I said, no, I have no idea. He must have, you know, fought in the Luftwaffe. He said, yeah, 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 yeah. But, but what do you really know about what he did? <laughs> 
I had no idea what he was referring to until we ordered another bottle of wine. And after that, we, we were all very, very sort of in, in a daze. And he said to me, do you realize that Captain Bauer was the personal pilot of Adolf Hitler? Well, you could have knocked me over with a feather. I was dumbfounded when I heard that. I sobered up instantly. And I thought, oh my God, how am I going to handle this? It's not every day. I've interviewed a lot of people in my time, but it's not every day that you get to talk to someone like that. He was Adolf Hitler's personal pilot. I think you called it one handshake away from the most evil man in history. So that's exactly how it was, because when we entered his house, and this was his third wife, by the way, she welcomed us into the house. She spoke no German. She was sweet, an absolute sweetheart, welcomed us into the house. He was upstairs, and eventually he came down the stairs, clunk, clunk, clunk. He was using a cane because he had a war injury. And I assumed, you know, that that was because he was a pilot. Um, Nevertheless, it was revealed to me later what the war injury was about, but he came down the stairs and, uh, you know, he was welcomed. He was, he was met, the man from Bonn met him first of all, and they introduced us to him to everybody and to me. I wasn't quite sure what to make of it, but when I shook his hand, I was, you know, talk about six degrees of separation. This was one degree of separation. How many times had that hand shaken the hand of Adolf Hitler? One of the greatest mass murderers and tyrants in history. Many times had that hand been that close to, to Hitler. And here I was shaking the very same hand. It was overwhelming. Anyway, we did the interview. The interview went extremely well. And uh, I got about 15 minutes of very, very good screen time about the delivery flight. I did not mention the Second World War. But I wasn't I going just, to go there. Yes. I just got to pop in here because the scene as you painted it is yes. what floored me. You're doing this interview. It's like the biggest pink elephant. Yes. The biggest gaslighting situation I can yes. imagine. You're surrounded by swastikas, pictures of him with not only Hitler, but Eva Braun and Goebbels. Yes. And, yes. and you're not talking about it. Uh, because like, I was, you see, the man from Bonn said to me, do not discuss the Second World War. So out of, out of uh, you know, out of politeness, I did not. I did not bring any How of it up. How did you manage that? Because I couldn't with, have. I with, literally couldn't have. With great difficulty, as you can imagine, with very, very great difficulty. Now comes the end of the interview, and I said to him, uh, Herr Kapitan, danke schön, thank you very much. The interview, that is good, everything is finished. So he claps his hand and calls his wife and says, Senta, schnapps, bring the schnapps. And of course, she brings a big silver tray with bottles of wonderful German alcohol, and it's, it starts to flow. And she brings out food, and you know. Mm -hmm. And he gets up and he say, he calls me over and he says, he calls me over to one of the pictures uh, up in, in the corner of the room. If the photograph is of him and Adolf Hitler and one of the Ju 52 aircraft that we've been talking about in this interview, the aircraft that we've been discussing. And he points to the aircraft and he says, yeah, das ist ein U-52. I said, yes, I see that, you know. Uh, and then he points towards, he looks at me and he didn't say anything. He said, he, he, then he points to Hitler. He said, you want to know about me and, 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 and him? And I said, and my friend. And I said, uh, yeah, bitte, please. And he said, right, come, sit, come and sit down with me. And he invited me over to the couch in the living room. And he calls his wife and he says, Senta, bring the photograph albums. <laughs> and she brought a pile of, must have been six or seven leather bound photograph albums in which is contained the inner history of the Third Reich. Everybody, all those henchmen, every single one of those characters that history now tells us, you know, ran that, uh, were the, the kingpins in that whole nasty period of history they're all in these photographs and in many of the images this guy Hans Bauer is in the background and if you see Hitler sitting down at a dinner party either with you know even Mussolini from Italy or with some of the Goebbels or whoever it is always in the background there was a place there was this man uh, Hans Bauer he was always there and Hans Bauer says to me you know Hitler was a very, very good friend of mine. He was always very, very good to my family. He looked after us extremely well during the war. I was not going to question him. 
I was not going to question him about the war. I certainly was not going to question him about the Holocaust. I wasn't going to ask anything to do with that. I left it all entirely to him. And all he did was, this was an old man regurgitating his memories. And I saw him, I tried to see him only as a pilot and not as an evil Nazi, you know, or a you member. You believe he knew, you believe he knew. What how could he, how, how could, could he, he not? how could he not? How could he not? How could he not know? Yeah, absolutely. And he tells me, you know, when he married his first wife, Adolf Hitler gave him his, his, wedding, his wedding party in Adolf Hitler's personal apartment in Munich. That's how close these two guys were. And uh, all he kept talking about was how nice Hitler was to him and his family. There are pictures of him at Berchtesgaden, Eva Braun, color images, black and white images. It was an unbelievable insight. I didn't probe, I didn't question anything. I just allowed him to flow, to give me and, all this information. And what was that in you that that allowed you to do that? That's what I'm trying to understand. I'm, I'm a very disciplined individual and I've learned that you have to do that. There are times where you have to control your emotions and you've just got to bottle up whatever is inside. You just got to deal with it accordingly and try to be as as respectful as you can, no matter who they are or who your interviewee may be. So it's the journalist or filmmaker in you. You have to be 100% professional and never mm -hmm. cross that boundary. You've got to. Right. You have to do that. Otherwise, you know, you're, you're, you're at a loss. I mean, then you just become part of the masses. And don't express your own opinions. It's about them. It's not about me. Mm -hmm. And anyway, at the end of the day, uh, you know, uh, as I was after I'd been given this incredible insight into this man's life, I was also told, by the way, that his gummy leg, that his bad leg, was as a result of him being shot by uh, Russian troops when they invaded Berlin because he was with Hitler the day Hitler decided that it was the day before Hitler took his life that night in the bunker, if that ever happened. But as far as we know, that that, that did happen. But he told me I was with uh, Hitler in the bunker and Hitler gave me a, 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 a personal painting of his that he rolled up, put in my backpack and said, take this and go, leave me. The war is over. There is no hope. Eva and I are going to end our lives tonight. Leave us alone. Just go. And he left the bunker and on the way uh, he was shot by um, invading Russian troops. That's where he got his war injury. And But the Russians always thought that he actually knew that Hitler had escaped with his life. And they arrested him and he went to a gulag for 15 years and they kept questioning him again and again and again and again because they really did believe that he knew that Hitler had survived the war and had probably gone either to an Arab country or to some, some South American country. Well, if that happened or not, we're still not sure about that. Mm -hmm. But they kept him for 15 years and eventually he was released. And, uh, and so that war win, they gave him a new leg, by the way, the Russians. Um, they had to amputate his leg because of the war injury, because of that shot. And uh, he was an absolutely charming man. And at the end of the day, all I could see in this guy was a retired pilot whose world was about airplanes and aircraft. I tried to keep the war out of it. I tried to keep the Holocaust out of it. I tried to keep Hitler and everything he stood for out of it. And it was only as we were driving away uh, at the end of the day, I looked back, uh, I was sitting in the rear seat of the vehicle and we were driving away from his house and he was standing outside his little picture book house with his wife waving to us like this, just an old couple saying goodbye to their friends, you know. Um, and as we turned the corner, they disappeared. And at that moment, it hit me like, again, like a ton of bricks. My God, that's what that woman saw in that mud hut in Africa 50 years ago. I will meet the man who knew the most evil man who ever lived. That's what I've just experienced. Again, that through line, that connection, the glue that holds the whole book together, you know, came to pass. She foresaw all of this. And there I was having spent an entire day with this man who knew Hitler probably better than anyone else. Why and is it? Why is it important for us to keep talking about what happened in when you take a look at today's world? I think it's terribly important to look at those things because whether you're talking about Ahmadinejad in, in, in Iran, you know, he denies that the Holocaust ever took place. What did, uh, what did Eisenhower say when he liberated Belson? 
He said, take as many pictures as you can, guys, because the day will come where some bastard will say this never happened. Well, it did happen. Take the photograph because here's the proof of it. You know, and the problem is that that kind of behavior goes on to this day. Look what is happening to the Rohingyas in Myanmar. Exactly. And yeah. you know, look what's happening in many countries in the Middle East. And look what's happening in many countries in Africa. Look at the genocides that still go on. We have not learned our lessons. And it's important for us to keep this alive so that we do learn these lessons. We've got to be stop behaving this way. And so in, I know we're almost at time for this hour, but in facing that direction, knowing we have to do something, how important is speaking up as it's happening? Because that's where, you know, at some point you get to the present. We're looking, we're talking about history. Yeah, yes. And then you got to get to a place where there are, pe there are things occurring now and people are not speaking. Oh, absolutely. Probably for the same reasons they did yes. back then, fear or mm -hmm. whatever it was. So silence is... Com being complacent on some no, level. Silence is not acceptable. We have to talk out. I mean, do, do you remember the trouble that poor old Jane Fonda got herself into during the Vietnam War? Mm -hmm. She was out waving flags and parading up and down the mall in Washington and all that. Good for her. It's important. We've got to do that. And you know, when I think about South Africa um, and how silent people remained during the days of apartheid, it was wrong. Uh, there were those who did speak out. Of course there were. Uh, but, you know, we can't allow this to happen and, and turn a blind eye to it. We've got to keep it alive. It, it's, uh, we've, we've got to end this kind of behavior. Um, it's absolutely essential. And there are many areas, I, I, you know, I know that the Palestinians are, are taught things that, you know, the Jews eat babies and things of that nature. All this kind of stuff is so unfortunate that these kind of things happen. Uh, they shouldn't, they really ought not to happen because it's all for political, either for, for political gain or for one uh, group of people to maintain a power uh, over another. Yeah, we're uh, back to power we, over. We have to learn to live in peace with one another. Otherwise, what is the point? You know, our cosmic journey is a learning process. And so what are we learning if we keep behaving this way? And when you look at the world today, it's exactly what is happening with all the polarization, not only the power over, but there's polarization yeah. in one yeah. side thinking it's right and the other is wrong. And that in itself is also, it certainly doesn't lend toward unity. Right? All, you all you have to do is look south of the border where you live, look down to the United States, look at the white supremacists in America, you know, 74 million people voted for a man who stood for all of that. I mean, it is shocking. It is frightening. Yeah, I know. How much time do we have, Mark? We're, we're basically done. We're done. So yeah. we're going to, I guess, let's wrap this up because I want to keep going if you're okay, Lionel. Absolutely. I, I really want to move into just still talking about what was ha what's happening in America and what was happening at the same time uh, in the South while they were boycotting South Africa, because I, I found that a really interesting parallel. Um, we're going to do a part two then, right, Mark? We're yeah, going to we wrap can carry this on. up. So wrap it up so we can edit it nicely, and then we'll carry on. All right. So we've been speaking with Lionel Friedberg about uh, his book, Forever in My Veins. And um, we're going to continue this conversation, part two, and touching on, get this, we're going to move from from apartheid and racism, we're going to move to near-death experiences and UFOs and a whole fascinating thing with the Voyager, which again, just piqued my interest. If you're interested in space and, and extraterrestrials, you really want to catch part two of this interview. And so where will that will be on consciouslivingradio.org as a podcast. It will probably get aired also on the live show, which is Wednesday Absolutely. night, 6 to 7 p.m., and then you can also find it on our YouTube channel. So thanks for joining right now. And like I say, part two, uh, as we continue to explore here, I mean, quite a life you've lived, Lionel. Thank you, um, Tessa. Thank yeah. you. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you. This is, this is, this is fun. Thank you so much. Oh, with everything you're sharing, Lionel, I'm hanging yeah. on the edge of my seat because unfortunately I didn't have time to uh, read the book <laughs> the way I would have liked to after Tasha was talking so much about it. But to hear your stories and the synchronicities of how everything comes into place and then how impactful that must have been for you seeing and hearing all these predictions yes. uh, coming true. Mm -hmm. and, and just the story you just talked about um, now, 
um, about the, the pilot is just, you know, like Tasha, it would just so many questions come up, but, uh, you know, thank you for sharing your work in these things with mm. the world, because I think it's super important. And, oh. you know, I think that elephant, you know, as much as you had that experience with them, that elephant saw and knew who you were for sure. And you know, was, was with you because it's just such a beautiful thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. My goodness. Thank you, Mark. It's all, it's all absolutely true. Yeah. Thank you. So we're going to dive back in. So we start like a fresh show, Mark, or how do I start? Well, just carry on and we'll, you know, I can okay. always edit and go from there. It, and you'll it, edit. Okay. Yeah. I just, I love the conversation. I'm hanging on the edge of my seat. <laughs> okay. Let's go. <clears throat> all right. You're, you're good. Hi, everyone. Uh, this is part two of an interview that we started um, speaking with Lionel Friedberg about his book Forever in My Veins. And it was just too interesting to stop at uh, the one hour mark. So we're, we're diving in continuing to dive in. Um, his book is fascinating. If you can get your hands on it, please read it. I think it's really relevant and important. And I believe we had finished just talking or just began to look at um, you grew up in South Africa in a, a time that uh, apartheid was the way that was life in South Africa. And I know the world responded in a really strong way as um, the country continued to uh, resist changing those laws. But you draw a parallel in your book, Forever in My Veins, where you talk about, wait a minute, at the same time that that was happening and the Americans doing economic sanctions and all sorts of protests, at the same time, I'd love you to describe what was going on in the South, in the States, and also if you can bring your, um, your sharing to, to Dr. Cameron, who was the fellow who had survived one of the lynchings. But I just found that such a unbelievable parallel. If we can start there and then we'll weave it into what's happening now in both right. countries. Mm, yes, sure. Uh, well, it was about uh, probably somewhere in the mid 90s, I was given the uh, a, a, a show to do called Vigilantes. And really what the show was about was it looked at the early West in, in, in the Western part of the United States after gold had been discovered. Uh, and in, in the, the, the largest city on the West Coast was San Francisco. Uh, but law and 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 didn't exist. There was law and disorder and theft and crime all over the place, and there there was no police force. There was nobody to protect local citizens. So people would band together and get together as vigilantes to take care to basically implement local um, law enforcement. Uh, so we looked at that, and then we looked at the uh, deep south. And then we looked at other aspects of, of vigilantism in America. But when we did the section on vigilantism gone wrong in the Deep South, this is where I was absolutely appalled because I had no idea of the scale of racial injustice that took place in this country round about the same time that America was wagging its fingers at South Africa saying, you better stop your racial system, you know, free for, you've got to give everybody the vote and everybody's got to be free citizens and you've got to be introduced democracy and all that. Well, the difference between South Africa and America was in South Africa, it was enshrined as law. It was never enshrined as law here in the United States, but white supremacy was alive and well, whether it took the form of the Ku Klux Klan or just marauding groups of vigilantes running around lynching blacks for the fun of it. Uh, I had no idea of the degree to which this was going on. And when we researched the section, and I met a guy, a man called Cameron, uh, who lived in Milwaukee, and he started a little museum called the Black Holocaust Museum, uh, because he was once arrested uh, for, for something that he did not do. And they were going to lynch him. They were going to kill him. They were going to hang him up from a tree and uh, set him alight, which is the modus operandi. That was the favorite uh, way of, of, of killing blacks those days. You know, in small towns throughout the deep south on a Sunday, people would be after church. They would be told there's going to be a lynching this afternoon. 
meet us at the whatever you know down at the river bank or meet us at whatever you know area of town it was bring your picnic baskets and bring your kids and bring a blanket we're gonna lynch a guy and it was a spectacle for all to see i had no idea that this even existed because it never ever 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 existed in south africa that kind of behavior never took place and yes. I think you said 5,000 blacks were murdered or lynched yes. in the deep south between the uh, late 1800s and the 1930s. Correct. Yeah. Brutally, absolutely brutally. And then parts of their body, their body parts were cut off, fingers and other appendages were cut off and sold as souvenirs, you know, yeah. uh, to people who'd come it's there. Barbaric. To, to, it, 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 it's worse than barbaric. Uh, and of course, some of this has been depicted in movies. Uh, and of course, one one talks about this to some to some degree or another. But the degree to which this was going on at the same time that South Africa was pointing its fingers at South Africa is like how <laughs> you know? Excuse me. Look look what you're doing in your own backyard. How how dare you point a finger at us? Look what you're doing, and what well, you're doing and, is and infinitely worse. Well, there is no, in my opinion, there's no worse. It's all on the scale of not acceptable. It's all part of. Yes. that system that we're talking about with power over and you know Correct. comparing atrocities i don't think it's it's even remotely helpful i think it's all in that same category absolutely um was there ever any accountability or apology for those atrocities in in in, in the united states yeah, yeah. yes there, there has been of course there has been uh, but it's taken a long long time to get there and now of course there is this wonderful new museum that exists in washington dc on the mall uh, to the African American, I think and, you you said in your book that uh, James Cameron was um, attended. And he a was public. He he did. He was given an official apology. Apology. Yes, years and years and years after it happened, but his two buddies uh, who were involved in the same incident that he was, they were murdered. They were mm -hmm. murdered. I mean, you know, it was too late for apologies. But he was apologized to, and he was very gracious about it. He was a charming, decent man. And I have no idea what happened to his Black Holocaust Museum. It's probably closed down now since the, uh, the, 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 the history of the African-American opened in Washington, D.C. Uh, but my goodness, that museum in itself, you know, it had depictions and dioramas of people being hum strung up from trees and, and drowned and, you know, set alight. And, and it was just absolutely appalling. Um, so, you know, um, we in this country are by, by no means uh, free of guilt. And... Um, we must remember this fact and it's got to be taught because a lot of people still think that way. All you have to do is to look, look around, you know, and look at the, you know, the, whatever the, uh, some of those groups were who invaded the, the capital in January in 2021, you know, with their t-shirts, um, with all these despicable slogans on them. I mean, you know, the fact that this goes on is just beyond my understanding. Well, and yet here we are attempting because to me, you've got we've got to we can't just put our hands up and go what what I don't know, I don't know what to do. There has to be a step that all of us can take. Yeah. And I think the first one is to examine our own privilege um, and that, you know, around whether it's race, gender, sexuality, it really doesn't matter. It's that that sense of entitlement that says yeah. I'm better than you, mm. nature. Uh, another human being, an animal. Mm. Um, you know, we're right back to the what we talked about in part one, that yeah. mm. unity is equality, is inclusion of diverse factors, as opposed right. to, you know, we're not the same. Like when we see through those eyes, yes, we're in trouble. There's nowhere to go. That's where there's nowhere to go. And I think I hear in you and in you in your explorations that there's always a search for... Um, a, a need to understand. I can feel that when you write that you're trying to understand something. And I think in this arena that we're talking about, let's see if we can take one step or two toward what anyone can do that will facilitate. Maybe we'll never understand, but there are things we could be doing that would facilitate um, a deeper compassion and unity, I think. I still believe in that. I'm still an optimist. Let's yeah. put it that way. Uh, we have to be an optimist. Uh, we have to.
uh, you've got to be an optimist. There always has to be light at the end of the tunnel. Right. And, and there always has to be something better on the other side of the horizon. You really have to believe that. And as a filmmaker, that's something that you learn very, very quickly. Uh, no matter how gruesome or how bad or how dark the message may be, there always has to be light at the end of the tunnel. There always has to be hope. And you, I, I nurture this belief that one day, you know, we will live on a peaceful planet, but we are so far from that at the moment. Um, I think a lot of it here, certainly in the United States, has to do with economic reasons, the fact that there aren't enough economic opportunities for people. And I think the pandemic, has, uh, the, 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 uh, the COVID has made, it, made, made things worse. Uh, I think it's going to take a long time for us to get out of the hole. Um, and hopefully when we are through the worst of this, hopefully when economic opportunities come back again, you know, that people will be given their just dues. Now, I'm in Hollywood. It is now a requirement. It's a requirement by the, the Motion Picture Academy and by the Television Academy that when you cast a film, you will have a variety of different actors in it. You will have a good racial mix. It's not just white bread anymore. You know, you've got to have, I mean, the days of Hattie McDaniel being the only person to win an Academy Award for Gone with the Wind back in 1939, and then nothing until the 60s was absolutely outrageous. Well, today that has changed considerably. Um, and that's a good thing. And of course, the, the, the creative talents have changed. The directors and writers and the pe people behind the camera are being given opportunities that they were never given previously uh, in, the, in the film and television industry here in the United States, but they are now. Thank goodness for that. That's all coming about. But how does that filter down, you know, mm. into, into everyday way of life and into, into the streets uh, we, on which you live? That's a tough one. And I think, you know, that economic uh, uh, um, um, opportunities may make that better. But really what it comes down to is just teaching your kids values and teaching your kids respect. We have to respect one another. We have to. It's all about being respectful of one another. We're all the same. We're no different. We may have different skin pigmentations, but so what? You know, and I take that to another level. I take that to the non-human world as well. We may have opposing thumbs, which allows us to hold a screwdriver or a, a pair of tools and make a and make a, a, a jet that flies through the sky, whereas animals don't have that, but that does not make us superior. It only makes us the dominant species. So we really need to be respectful of all life. Um, and that depends so much on home values, on the educational system, and, you know, on the grassroots level from day one. Expose, yeah. your, expose one's kids to the right things. And to me, this is a perfect segue to extraterrestrials because I've often, from childhood, I, my fantasy was I would be walking in the country, <laughs> yeah. looking up at the dark sky, star-studded sky, but far, far away from anywhere, alone, seven years old. And I would have conversations with, with the beings up there. And I'd say, take me, beam me up, take me, <laughs> yes. because I'm going to help you understand people. Yes. Now, what a ridiculous thing for a child to say, but I somehow thought I was some no. ambassador that was going to help. No, no. help. You, you were ahead of everybody else. Absolutely. You were right. <laughs> and so what, but, but here was the other thought I landed in for this kind of unity that we're talking about, this respect. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We've got to find the commonality yeah. that weaves us all together beyond gender, beyond the color of our skin, beyond economic uh yeah. status and that yeah. is earth yes. we are human beings we are well it, let's just go there and we are earthlings and yeah. i i thought does it do we need to be attacked by extraterrestrials for us to join together and say we are we as a yeah. species i used to have that fantasy too <laughs> but you stepped into and i want i'm moving towards ufos before we get to the voyager mm. project because mm. both very fascinating to me Mm. Um, well, maybe let's go to the Voyager first, and then we'll come back to some of the things that you experienced in your, uh, in your work with UFOs. So tell us about the Voyager project and its purpose, because it's, it's fascinating. Well, Voyager was part of a wonderful series on the public broadcasting system here in the United States in the 80s. The series was called The Infinite Voyage. It was a science series. It looked at various branches of science. And I was very, very fortunate enough to be given, I still regard it as my favorite film of all time. 
um, I was given the opportunity of making a film about the Voyager mission. They, NASA called it the Grand, the Grand Tour. The planets were lined up in such a way that if they sent a spacecraft from Earth to Jupiter, it would be able, this spacecraft would be able to take advantage of Jupiter's gravitational pull and twist it into a direction that sent it towards Saturn. And then there were two voyages. And one of the voyages, once it reached Saturn, it would reach Saturn at such a time and at such a, 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 an, an angle that the gravitational pull of Saturn would sling it outwards towards the planet, the planet Uranus. And then from Uranus, again, to talk about the Grand Tour, Uranus would sling it out towards Neptune. So we got four planets in one mission. It's unbelievable. It's crazy. The other spacecraft only went to Jupiter and Saturn. Now, both of these spacecraft are still flying today, and they won't stop ever. Everything else that we've sent into space has either been uh, crashed into a moon uh, or burnt up in the atmosphere of other planets, but not the voyages. The voyages, as far as I'm concerned, and this is, and I'm quoting Carl Sagan here. He was in the movie. <clears throat> Carl Sagan said, you know, this is mankind's, most sophisticated calling card. These little, these little spaceships will never end. They'll just keep going and going and going, and they'll never end. <clears throat> the next, the, the think, next time <laughs> you said he called it a message in a bottle cast uh, into the cosmic sea, right? That's, that's exactly. That's so Sagan, isn't it? Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes. Billions and billions and billions. Yes. <laughs> And, you know, the, the uh, Voyager 2 will probably reach the next star in about 40,000 years from now. And each of these spacecraft has a little gold disc bolted to the side of what they call the bus, which is the main body of the spacecraft. I have a replica of that on my wall upstairs, and it's got a diagram of the Earth and two human beings. And for an intelligent species, if they look at this diagram, they can kind of figure out that, oh, this is the area of the galaxy where the spacecraft comes from. Um, and it's got that image on it. And on this gold record are also embedded digital images of planet Earth and the sounds of planet Earth. Some of our great music and also messages from children. And, the, the, and all the messages is hello from the children of planet Earth in something like a hundred different languages. And there's little instructions on that on that diagram as well as to how to play that record, how, how to get the digital images out of it. So any any species with any reasonable degree of intelligence, if they come across these spacecraft, will be able to figure it out. Oh, that's how you do it. We can get stuff out of here. Um, so and I, I want to know how we depicted human beings because I'm probably going to disagree. I want to <laughs> know the songs that were picked. <laughs> that yeah. depict the best of humanity well you know it's very interesting i i keep a tape of the of the recordings or or a, a dvd of, of them a cd in my car and i often play it to myself and it's it's got everything on it it's got it's got rock and roll it's got so what beatles songs are on it it's got some beatles on it. i forget which number which which one it is only one only one only one uh, Chick Corea is on it uh, there are there's rock and roll but there's also beethoven and there's bach and there is, uh, I do believe there's, a, there's Mozart. There are the classical ones as well. But lots and lots and lots and lots of them. This is very important. Ethnic music. <clears throat> Rattles and gongs and the sound of people living in the middle of jungles and remote places because yeah. that, that music is equally valid. It's also wonderful stuff. Right, right. And all of that is on this record. And, you know, I often play that and I think, my God, you know, what a rich panoply of sounds we have created us, we humans. Um, this is our finest expression. Music is our finest expression because it is a universal language. Right. You don't have to know the words. Right. You don't have to understand what it's saying. It's an emotional thing. It plays with your emotions. And how, <clears throat> and how much, what better art can you get than that? The one that twists your emotions without you even understanding the language that it's using. I think it's just incredible. So music is so, so absolutely critical, but it's got lots of images of oceans, of marine creatures, of birds, of mammals, of a whole variety of different species. Just the richness of the tapestry of life as we know it on earth. But no is, history or is there also? No, no, no history. Uh, th that would be a difficult subject yes. to tackle because yes. it's, it's just pictures and sounds and, you know, sights. So it's uh, our calling card. 
It is a calling card. It's exactly what it is. It's a calling card. And it's the most sophisticated calling card we have. And so often when I think about Voyager, uh, and one of the one of the engineers was either an engineer or a scientist said to me one night, you know, in about 30 years from now, and this, I made the film in 1990 during the Neptune encounter. And he said, you know, about 30 years from now, well, it's now 30 years later. He said, if you're up in the high Sierras in California and you look up in that direction, and he pointed somewhere to the sort of west, he said, just remember that there's a little spacecraft going out there and it's not going to stop. It just keeps going and going and going. It does a million miles a day, by the way. Wow. A million miles a day. And the incredible thing is this, Tosha. Just think about this. You know, when the human mind puts itself to something, think of what we're capable of doing. Here at JPL in Pasadena, right? Not too far from where I live, maybe 30 miles away from where I live, at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is a, an agency that operates all these deep space missions on behalf of NASA. They talk to Voyager every single day. A signal comes back from that spacecraft to say, we're still detecting some he some atoms from the sun, or we're not, or whatever it is in uh -huh. deep space, or we're detecting star noise, you know, the noise of space, the sounds of the sounds of the universe, and it transmits this back to Pasadena. And everything is recorded every single day. And they can still tell the 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 dish on the spacecraft, turn a little bit more to the left, turn a little bit more to the right. Wow. It takes days before the signal gets there, but it does get there. And, you know, if we are capable of doing things like that, imagine what we really are capable of doing um, in making the world such a wonderful place with all our technology and, and all our capabilities and all our science and all our institutions, you know, and still there are wars and there are conflicts and there are disagreements and there are all these dreadful things that happen all the time. Imagine how it was if we applied ourselves to something like the Voyager mission to make things work and to mm -hmm. make them work as beautifully as that does. It's a, it's, 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 it's a, it's, it's a well, textbook case. It, it's beautiful. And as I listen to you talk, I go, the, the missing piece is that each person would actually have to look <laughs> inward and clean up whatever's going on inside your own system that isn't helpful. Like this is, again, back to the question, what does it mean to be human? What about the darkness of humanity? You can't pretend it's not there. You no. have to actually make peace with it mm -hmm. and and inside yourself. So it, it's not a part of your perception and behavior. Absolutely. But before we go down any other road, I'd love, is there a way that people could see this film? Because I think it's profound. I seem to recall having seen it at a festival many years ago. The film is available on YouTube, but people have to be careful because there are a number of versions of it. Okay. And there's, there's one version that's full of, uh, of, uh, of subtitles, but there is one that's clean and it's called um, Sail On, comma, Voyager, exclamation mark. Sail On Voyager, and it's on YouTube. But they have to be careful which version they watch. The film runs one hour, and so they've got to look at the time. Uh, okay. It runs, uh, I think it's 58 minutes. Um, and try Mark's and already on it, I can tell. Yeah. He's already yeah. Googling it and going, can I find this? And yeah. put it, could you put it on our page, you, Mark? You, you, you know what? I can send you the link, by the way, as, a, as a, yeah. in, an e in an email. I can find it sure, for you. Yeah, that'd be great. I'm, I'm looking for it right now. And uh, I did actually add a link uh, to NASA about the golden plate and the music on there for anybody who's interested. Oh, mm -hmm. so interesting. Yeah. That'd be great and to include. What was the name interview. of the film again? Sail? Sail on. Voyager, yeah. sail on Voyager, sail on comma Voyager exclamation mark. Yes, um, and you know what, what was so amazing were the, the the scientists were amazing, the engineers were amazing, everybody who was involved with that mission was so extraordinary, and they all worked together so beautifully. And if we can come together to yeah. accomplish something like that, think of what we really are capable of doing. And you know, you talk about um, Tasha, you talk about cleaning out the negativity and cleaning out the dark side. There is darkness, I think, in everybody's life. Um, but that amazing symbol of yin and yang, which I believe uh, is either it's either Chinese or Hindu, summarizes it perfectly. You know, you've got those two images that they look like two teardrops next to mm -hmm. each other in, the, in that circle. Dark and light. You know, the darkness serves the light in many, many ways because in order to reach the light, we as beings who learn by experience, you've got to be pushed towards the light. And the darkness has that role. It, 
negativity and darkness and violence and all of those things are all elements that push us towards the light, towards enlightenment, mm -hmm. to get away from the darkness. So darkness and all the rest of it is not without purpose. The cosmos and the universe and whoever designed all this stuff knew what they were doing, you know. Uh, we need the dark to force us to start thinking more in an enlightened way exactly in order to enlighten our spirits and our perceptions mm -hmm. and our souls as we all go on this incredible cosmic journey mm -hmm. i mean what you're discussing because I, I don't see that you can get rid of i think as soon as you're trying to get rid of something it's going to stay yes that, that's literally it will stay so i am not making the darkness I'm not creating a judgment saying it's bad or wrong. I agree with you. It has a purpose. Right. But my approach to it, my response to it in me mm -hmm. is it, it, it has to be the same response that I have toward the light. Correct. In other words, I am not in a polarity of judgment. I'm just going, ah, there it is. So I'm not asleep to it. Yeah. Um, but it's a, it's a relationship that's not based on good and bad. It's yes. out of the polarity yes, of sir. judgment. Yes, that's, I hear you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So back to UFOs, you, um, I know you had an experience in Saskatchewan in Canada yeah, where yeah, you took in, a picture. <laughs> Tell us about that. In Saskatchewan of all places. So yeah. I was, I was working at that time for the National Film Board of Canada based in Montreal. And uh, we were doing a documentary on the history of housing in Canada, how urban areas develop throughout Canada. And of course, uh, as one knows, most of the major metropolitan areas in Canada are, you know, built in a, in a, in a thin line just above the north of the, the, the border of the United States. Canada is absolutely huge. And other than the shale uh, tar pits and, you know, uh, where, the, where the oil is and where the minerals are, you know, it takes a, takes a long time for towns and urban areas to develop in those areas. So the documentary was all about how do urban areas develop around agricultural activities or mining activities or whatever it was. And remember, the year is 1966. So um, we were out in Saskatchewan, and what we had to do was to film at a potash plant. Now, Saskatchewan is, is absolutely flat, as one knows, you know, it's a very, very flat province. Um, and we were staying at, it was a very small crew, just three of us, and we were staying at a small motel not far from this potash plant. I would say it was probably uh, the nearest city, I don't even remember, Regina, I, anyway, it was in the middle of nowhere. Right. Um, and so we had to go to this potash plant and you could see the plant from miles away from where we were staying because when you mine the stuff out of the ground and forgive my ignorance but i forget exactly what potash is and how they get it and how it was formed but it's a mineral and i think they use it in 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 uh, in uh, fertilizers and various things um as they mine it it creates white dust and this white dust goes up like a sort of column and then just sits above the mine like this in a big cloud all day long so we had our breakfast at the motel and we were driving towards this potash plant, heading towards this big white cloud on the horizon, you know, about maybe two hours away. And um, when we got to the plant itself, the guy at the main gate says, you better get down to the parking lot pretty quickly because there's something up there in that cloud. So the director said, I, I wasn't directing the film, the director said, like, what, what is it? <laughs> He said, we don't know, but there's something in that white cloud. Oh, really? <laughs> so <clears throat> we, we went down to the parking lot. The director met the manager of the mine, and they had to go inside to discuss the filming that was going to take place for the rest of the day. But I stayed, those are the days of station wagons. I stayed at the station wagon, set up the camera on a tripod, put on the longest lens that we had, something like a 300 millimeter lens, I think it was, we were shooting 16 millimeter film. So a 300 millimeter lens was, was pretty powerful uh, for that gauge of film stock. And I put that on and I trained it up on, the, on, the, on this cloud. And a few guys who were, were working on the plant came up to me, you know, smoking cigarettes, just wanting to shoot the breeze and chat. And we were talking away. And, you know, one of them suddenly said, oh, look, there it is, there it is, there it is. And a little bit of a, of a breeze had come up and had cleared this cloud. And I saw a glint of what clearly looked like metal, um, silver. Just a quick, you know, kickback of the sun. And I thought, oh my God, there is something up there. And I pressed the, the, the camera button and started running film. 
And thank goodness, the breeze came up a little stronger and revealed this object sitting up in that cloud. Now, many people have said to me, well, how big was it? How high was it? Uh, yeah. Very difficult to judge distances and very difficult to judge sizes. But I'm not exaggerating if I tell you that it was the size of, now, they didn't exist in those days. This was long before the day of the Boeing 747. But that's the size that this thing was. And it was a round disc, completely round, no windows, no method of propulsion visible at all. Underneath it, a sort of triangular shaped object connected to the disc by, a, by a, like a, a triangle, like a tripod, just sitting there. No sound, nothing. And I thought, what? And I just ran film. I must have run about 150 feet of film. That translates to, you know, a good, quite a lot of, of, of screen time. But it wasn't doing anything. Anyway, I ran the film and I thought, okay, that's, I've got it. And I turned off the camera and then the breeze came back, covered it up. And we got on with our work that day. We got on with filming at the potash plant, but you know, we were, we were very intrigued by what we had shot. So came that night, we were back at the motel. I was the one responsible for canning up all the film and sending it to the lab in Montreal. Mm -hmm. And the way we did that those days was we went down to the local railroad station <laughs> and you gave it to the local CN uh, railroad manager or, or, or Canadian Pacific and it was sent by rail all the way back to Montreal back in those, those days. Wow. <laughs> um, so I canned this up and I, I put it in a separate can of film, sealed it up and I put on the label hold for, for our return. That's all I put. I didn't write down any details about it at all as I did with all the other stuff that we shot mm -hmm. because we had no idea what it was. Anyway, <clears throat> so we finished uh, our, our, our job and we eventually ended up back in Montreal and came the day to look at the dailies, look at the mm -hmm. rushes of what we'd shot. And we sat in the theater for hours and hours and hours looking at pretty dull, boring stuff of, you know, uh, uh, cornfields and small towns and railroad tracks and whatever else. And at the end of all of this, uh, the head of the camera department was there, the director was there, and a few other people were there who were involved in the, in the subject of the film. Uh, I forget what agency it was that commissioned the film. It was a government agency. And uh, as we had finished all of this, you know, we were all relieved. And at the back, suddenly the projectionist yells out, do you want me to run this thing that says hold for, for our return? And <laughs> I said, yeah, put it on. So he laced that up onto the projector and ran it on the screen. And, you know, we were all knocked out of our socks because there it was exactly as I had seen it. This big, huge, round disc Obviously, it, it was thicker in the middle as, than it was, and then it tapered down to a thin uh, edge, and this tripod-like shape just sitting there, doing nothing. And the head of the camera department, who was a man by the name of Dennis Gilson, he said, I wonder what the Dickens that is. You know, we should send that down to the United States Air Force. They have a research division called Project Blue Book at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in, in Ohio. Maybe they can make some sense of this. Now, I have to tell you this. The kind of film stock we were using, you could use two different kinds of film stock back in those, back in those days. One was negative film, where you shoot negative film, and then you make a positive print from that. So the negative remains your master, and you keep that in the lab. You don't ever mm -hmm. use that. You make a, a positive print from that. Or you used a, a kind of film that we used to call reversal. The same film that you use in the camera is what you can actually run in the projector because it, it came out with a positive image. And that's what people often used to use in the days when they used to take slides. You know, you go to Disneyland mm -hmm. and you take slides, you take a picture, you know, you take slides. You used to shoot on reversal film. So what, what you use in your camera is what you, 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 you look at at home. Um, so we, we, we shot this on reversal film and that was our undoing. Why? Because we didn't make a copy of the film. So uh, the film was uh, uh, packed up and sent by some courier. I forget who it was. I have no idea. It was long before the days of FedEx and UPS and all of those. We sent it to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. 
And um, then I worked on another film. And one day I was went back to the camera department um, and on my way uh, in, I said to the, the woman who worked there, uh, who was the sec secretary of the, of the head of the, of the department, I said, Frankie, her name was Frankie Johnson. I said, Frankie, did we ever hear back from those guys in the States about you know, mm -hmm. that, that, that footage that we sent them? She said, oh, no, 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 uh, let me, I, we never heard back. I'll find out and I'll let you know. So a day later, she calls me into the office and she said, I called them up. They denied receiving it. Now we know it was signed for because it went by courier. We know that they had it. We know that they got it. And they said to her, they basically said, what film? Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so um, does this play into the theory that there is a cover-up? Yes, I believe it does. And, you know, I go, to an, I go to an annual event. I haven't been this year and I didn't go last year because of the, of the pandemic. But there's a wonderful event that takes place in Palm, Palm Springs every year called Contact in the Desert, where you have people coming from all walks of life to discuss rewriting human history. Are, the, are there aliens? If so, where are they? Who are they? Where do they come from? And on and on and on and all kinds of stuff and about shamans and whatever else. It's a wonderful event. It takes five days, you know, and it's just a way to shoot the breeze with, with a lot of really interesting people. Most of them are there, there out of curiosity, but there's some really good people there as well. And that's where I met Erich von Daniken, who was the guy who wrote Chariot of the Gods back in 1968, mm -hmm. which brought to the public's um, awareness the fact that maybe um, beings from other worlds have been visiting this planet, you know, by looking at ancient stone ruins and, and monuments. And I met him, an interesting guy, plus a lot of others uh, go to contact in the desert. Anyway, um, so there is absolutely no question in my mind whatsoever that we have been visited many, many times. Now, I know Graham Hancock. Graham Hancock is a is a best-selling author around the world who talks about ancient ruins and how they were constructed and some of the images that are depicted on these ruins. But I, but I don't even have to go to people like that. I don't have to go to these so-called authorities. If you look at or, or, or meet people like the Sun Bushmen who live in the Kalahari Desert in Botswana, back in Africa, they talk about the people who come from the other world. They do a trance dance around the fire, the men. They are nomadic people. They don't stay in one place for longer than two or three mm -hmm. days, and then they move along. The women play the drums. The men are, are the hunters. They're hunter-gatherers, and at night they have this dance around the fire, and they go into another realm. They really go into another level of, of consciousness. And uh, the reason why they do that is in order to almost do re remote viewing as to where the wildlife will be in two days' time. Where will the hunt be successful? That's why they do this. And I, through an interpreter, you know, once uh, found out that they talk about these, these beings that come from this other world as though it's, uh, it's you know, it's, uh, don't worry about that. That's the number 12 bus comes by every day, you know. To them, it's just a regular thing. Nothing to be, be <laughs> nothing to be alarmed about. They accept it as that's it. It happens. No question, you know. And, and you... I have, I've, no, I've asked shamans in, in, in yeah. Brazil, in Brazil, in, in the, I've asked shamans in, in Ecuador and so on. And certainly here in North America, you know, do you believe in, 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 in aliens? Are there beings on other worlds? Of course, without any hesitation. Of course yes. there are. Yes. Of and course can are. you share Gordon um, Cooper, the Mercury astronaut chasing <laughs> a UFO? That's kind of cool. I'm amazed at your memory. You really recall these things. Absolutely. So I did a show called Ancient Encounters for the History Channel. Uh, it was hosted by Leonard Nimoy um, in the 90s. And what this show was about was have, have any UFOs been documented in the past? And we went right back to ancient Egyptian times. And on certain ancient Egyptian uh, tomb walls, are objects that look exactly like UFOs are often depicted by people who have who have seen them, uh, and even people who have claimed to have been abducted by the the occupants of these craft. So <clears throat> the the show has a, had a lot of material that we could use, and I wanted to ask Gordon Cooper about his experience because he came out one day and I forget where it was, but he said I have seen UFOs and they do exist. I tracked him down. He was retired. He was no longer. A, he was one of the original Mercury 7 astronauts. 
And when he was a pilot with the United States Air Force based in Germany, it was in the early 60s, he told me, I went to see him in his office and he said, sure, of course, they're, they're, they're here. They've been here forever. And he said, you know, I was, we were based uh, at Rammstein in Germany and one day we got a scramble signal and we had to take off and we had to go and investigate an object that was flying, I don't know, something like 50,000 feet above the ground, which is very, 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 very high. And uh, the Sabre jet, the F-86s could reach that altitude with difficulty, but they could. And he said, we, we came across the circular object. Well, it defied everything we knew about flight. It defied the physics that we knew. It came to a standing a standstill and then it would shoot off at thousands of miles an hour. We couldn't keep pace with it. We tried to take photographs of it, nothing doing. This thing was just absolutely amazing. It was not of this earth, that I know. And, uh, he, and he told me, he said, you know, we as uh, when we were belonged to NASA, we were sworn to secrecy that if ever we did come across anything like this, don't talk to the press and don't talk to the public. This is not for common knowledge. They were instructed to not talk about this stuff. Well, you know, there have been many, many examples of that because I also spent a day once with Neil Armstrong, who, as we all know, was the first man on the moon. And he was doing a show on the history of flight. And they were filming at Mojave Airport here in California. And uh, during the lunch break, I said to him, Colonel, do you mind if I have lunch with you? You know, and the, the truck came along and, uh, with the sandwiches and whatever else. And it was as hot as Hades. And I said, let's go and sit in the camera truck in, in the cab. And we did, and uh, and 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 uh, he had his plate of food, and I had mine. And I said to him, Colonel, and, and I knew I was taking a risk by asking him this because he, he he was a very very private individual, and I was warned about this. But I said to him, Can I ask you a personal question? And he sort of looked at me askance like this, as though, Oh no, here it comes again, you know. <laughs> he said, What? And I said. The rumors that you and Buzz Aldrin had seen something on the surface of the moon, is there any truth to that at all? And then I sort of shut up, you know, mm -hmm. and he said to me, you didn't ask me that, and I'm not going to answer it. And he just kept on eating his lunch. What does that tell you? <laughs> you <know? Wow. laughs> well, it, it, it tells me that you know, if it was an absolute negative or a no, it would be like, no, what are you, that, that's just crazy talk. It's, you know, the, like some sort of a defense of it is what I would exactly to say. Exactly. And, yeah. Wow. No, 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 you didn't ask me that and I'm not answering it. Yeah. And yeah. this, you know, what we're talking about so weaves together. I know it's not obvious at the beginning, perhaps if you named all these different topics that we've, you know, put our toes into, mm. but I'm about to move into near-death experiences. It, yeah. it, it all still stems back and weaves back to our interconnectedness, right. to who are we as humans? Why yes. are we here? What is, the, what is this universe? What is the mystery? Because it is a mystery, so much mystery. Yeah. And you've been shown and had personal experiences of so many different things mm -hmm. um, and in your book, of course, weaving it together with the fact that many of them were predicted. Yeah. Uh, by shamans in Africa, that in yes. itself, yeah. you know, is amazing. But let's, let's move into Beyond Death, the documentary you did about near-death experiences and exploring mm. that whole realm. Yeah, right. Um, this was a show called Beyond Death. And by the way, that's also available on YouTube, Beyond Death. And again, be careful which one you uh, choose because there are versions of it. The, the show runs just under two hours, but it's on, it's on YouTube. And uh, the, the brief was, what happens to consciousness after the demise of the physical body? Where does it go? Is there any scientific proof that consciousness can exist outside of the physical body? And if so, when the physical body dies, what happens to that consciousness? That was the brief. Don't give us any ooga booga haunted houses, things that go bump in the night. We want science, you know. <laughs> so we tried to give them science. I forget the... The, the, the cable channel that it was for. It might have been for A&E, but I, I can't recall. Anyway, it's, it, it'll be, uh, it's on that documentary. And, um, and I met a number of individuals uh, who all claim to have had near-death experiences, who all claim to have died. 
but had lived through that experience and were resuscitated back again and who remembered what happened to them when they were clinically dead. One of the most astounding stories was uh, a woman who had uh, a, an aneurysm of the brain and I, I interviewed her and I interviewed uh, her surgeon in Atlanta. And um, she, they, had to, they had to stop her heart because they had to stop the blood from flowing in order to open the skull, in order to access the aneurysm and cut it out. Otherwise, she would have bled to death when they removed the aneurysm. And then quickly sew her up again, put the skull back in one place and you know, get going. Now, there's a limited amount of time that the brain can do without oxygen before it, mm -hmm. it, it's permanently damaged. But for, for however the longest period of time that, that, that the human brain can uh, survive, um, th this is how long she was, she was basically um, clinically dead. Um, and then when she, when she re was revived from the surgery, uh, the surgeon said, you know, to her, are you feeling? She said, oh, absolutely fine, except I was, I was really cold when I came back again. And he said, what do you mean you were very cold when you came back? And he, she said to him, well, you know, I, I, I saw everything you did. Um, and when I came back into my body, it was very, very cold. And he said, came back into your body, like, what do you mean? And she said, well, while you were operating on me, I floated out of my body and I was looking down in the operating room, looking down at what you were doing. And of course, he didn't believe a word of it, the surgeon. And he started asking her questions over a period of days, of course, not right away, uh, as she regained her strength. And she came out with the most extraordinary thing. She said, you don't believe me, do you? And he said, well, it's hard for me to believe that. Mm -hmm. And she said, well, what about the time when the nurse, you asked the nurse for a certain instrument and she passed it to you and she dropped it and you scolded her. Why did you do that? That wasn't her fault. He said, you saw that? <laughs> mm -hmm. And she said, yeah, I saw that. Why, why, why did you pay her? You know, it wasn't her fault. <laughs> Not only that. He, because the surgery was so long, he had a little tape deck playing in the corner of the operating room. You know, it took about four hours, this whole procedure. And she said to him afterwards, she said, you know, I don't like all your music. <laughs> and he said, what do you mean? She said, well, this group and that group and that one, I like that one, but I didn't like this. He said, how do you know? She said, I was listening to it. I was up floating in the, on the ceiling and I was listening to your music. Well, you know, he said to me that he had no doubt whatsoever that what this woman was telling was the truth. Now, here's the interesting thing. I interviewed a number of adults who were clinically dead and described to me what had happened to them. But the most extraordinary thing were the children. Because I was introduced to a pediatrician up in uh, Seattle who had done work with young children the age of about five, six, seven years of age who were all clinically dead and were resuscitated. They were brought back to life again. And they weren't all his patients, but he kept a file about all of them because the other surgeons who had worked with these kids knew that he was doing research on them. And he kept a file about all of these kids. And I was allowed to, to interview three of them. And <clears throat> he said to me, you know, the most extraordinary thing is all of these children had similar dreams. And I asked them to draw what they called was their dream when they were asleep and look at this he opens up the book and he shows me these pictures and without exception all of these kids drew a tunnel a long tunnel and they said they went down this tunnel some of them said at the other end of the tunnel was jesus some of them said at the other end of the tunnel was a doctor in a white coat some of them said there were angels at the end of the tunnel in white coats and they invited me into this big room and then they were given the option to either stay in this big room with them or come back to mommy and daddy. They were given that option. And all of these kids who were resuscitated, they said, well, we decided, all right, we'll, co we'll go back to mommy and daddy. So one child said they were given a green or a red button to press. And if I pressed the green button, I would go back to mommy and daddy. Another child said I would, there was a lever. And if I pulled this lever, I would go back. Another child said I was given, there was a door. If I went through that door, I would go back to mommy and daddy. If I went through that door, I could stay here where I was. So there was this option that they were given. They were all given the choice of returning back to the land of the living. And their images were so similar. These are kids. They don't make this up. And none of these kids knew each other. Yeah. So yeah. you're convinced, like, what did it do for you in terms of making this documentary? What did Well, you know, I, I've, had, I've had my own experience about this when my father passed away. 
my father uh, was a, was a, was an absolute skeptic and um, my father was diagnosed with lung cancer when he was 63 years old and uh, he was living in zambia at the time and i had to bring him down to south africa for medical treatment and he was diagnosed they, they told me he'd probably got six months to live and um one day i said to him dad let's let's go and take a walk and i'm an only child so i was very close to my both my parents and i went walking with my father and i said dad you know you are going to die from this because there's no way they can heal you yeah i know about that yes i'm fine i'm fine with it you know he was fine and even then he was still smoking his cigars and his cigarettes you know he said if i'm going to die i'm going to die that's the end of the story it doesn't matter you know and i said i want you to do me a favor and this may sound very strange to you but don't laugh at me i said when you do die if you can would you make contact with me and he said yeah 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 you know <laughs> yeah i'll do that and forgot about it so comes the day where i get a telephone call come to the hospital now your father is in the process of transitioning and he was dying my mother was there um, my first wife at the time was also there the nurses were there and i went to him and he the, the cancer had got to his brain and uh I, I held his hand when he passed away and um this was about 11 or 12 o'clock in the morning uh, that 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 day and that night i was in bed um i couldn't sleep but my my father-in-law who was a doctor had given me something to help me sleep that night um because it was a pretty traumatic experience nevertheless and um and uh, somewhere in the middle of the night i woke up and i heard what was an echoing footsteps and i i sat up straight in bed and at the foot of the bed there was my father looking as young younger than he'd ever looked in his life healthier than he'd ever looked in his wife and he came around around the bed and he stood over me like this and he just looked down at me he said nothing all he did was he looked at me and he smiled and he nodded his head as if to say you were right there is more he turned around and left the room my wife suddenly woke up and she said who was that who was that who was here so i said what do you mean she said i heard footsteps who was in the room <laughs> uh you know death is not the end of it at all and uh i am an absolute and fervent i don't like to use the word belief because belief sounds like throwing faith at something without mm -hmm. any without any proof but i know that reincarnation is a fact of life we all go through many lifetimes right. all of us whether we're a pony or a person or a petunia we keep going round and round and round and we're all on a cosmic journey we're all evolving all the time for what purpose who knows to where who knows but that's not the point mm. the point is it's happening and the point is that we are on this journey and the point is that the cosmos is even stranger than our wildest imaginations can ever imagine it to be and that's what's important yeah so tell our listeners i know we've got to start to wrap things up here can where I they can be, be, get before your we book. go there I, I just i just want to comment on your last story lionel because as you tell the story of your father that was a very similar experience my grandmother had when my grandfather passed away yes um you know it was a it was a ringing of a phone she got up in the middle of the night and he came through the the back door yes and like you say he was an young in the best shape best looking like in, in that exactly how you described i get chills thinking about it mm -hmm. um yeah, beautiful thank you so much for sharing you know it was as, as real as though he was in the flesh mm -hmm. uh it, it, it was that real um and many people have told me similar stories mm -hmm. many many people i don't doubt it for one moment and you know when when kids when kids say oh mommy look there's grandma sitting over there in the corner and what mommy says is you've never met your grandma grandma died before you were born what are you talking about that you that's your imagination they shouldn't do that they should say oh why don't you ask grandma how she's doing yeah. ask, ask her how she's feeling or describe her to me but don't make the child deny it because that's how we take this away we we all have this capacity this capability but mm -hmm. our, our, our culture denies it to us mm -hmm. Our culture limits us so much mm -hmm. into yeah. little boxes as opposed to everything we've been talking about is the reverse. It's an opening of interconnected 
you know, on the grid, whether it's our ancestors or each other or, you know, energy is connected. It isn't se separated and labeled. As, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so, even, the, even the scientists will tell you this. You can destroy anything except energy. That, that goes on. It does, you can't destroy yeah. energy. It continues yeah. in another form. Right. So where can our listeners get your book? So again, it's called Forever in My Veins, the, How Film Led Me to the Mysterious World of the African Shaman. Where can yeah. they get it? Uh, it's available if your bookstore is open. Under these pandemic conditions, it may not be, but it should be in your local bookstore. Otherwise, it'll be available online from Amazon.com, uh, Amazon.com US, Amazon.com Canada. Uh, it's available on Barnes & Noble website. Um, it's available throughout the English-speaking world. Um, so it's available online uh, or at your local bookstore. And what's next for you? Do you have any projects coming up? Well, or anything the, you want to share? The next one is, 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 is a history of aviation in Africa. I'm totally fascinated by aviation. I love techie stuff. I love engineering. And I love the, uh, the challenge, you know, of doing really hard things. So I wrote this book about, about aviation in Africa. It's called The Flying Springbok, and that'll be available uh, in July. Awesome. It has been such a pleasure getting to know you a little bit. Um, I want to leave, when it, this is being played on the radio, I'm really big on music and, and want to leave everyone with Peter Gabriel's song called Biko, which pays homage to a South African anti-apartheid mm, activist, wonderful, Stephen wonderful. Bantu Biko, who died in 1977 while in police detention. Yes. And, and I think because we have two shows, I'm also going to, I know there was a lot of controversy around Paul Simon going to South Africa mm. um, during apartheid. But he also, I'm on the sort of on the other side going, he also opened internationally the world to the beauty of black um, tribal, you know, uh, music. And, and I think he did so much. I think that tour did so much, even though there were many protests and a lot of people not on that side. Let me um, just say one thing about Paul Simon. Mm. When, when Paul Simon first went to Africa to do his big concert there with Lady Smith Black Mombazo and, yeah. and all of that and, and, and playing, you know, the shoes yeah. are studded with diamonds and all those wonderful songs, mm -hmm. that was in Zimbabwe, not South Africa. He would not go to South Africa. Ah, okay. He went to South Africa. That. He went to South Africa later, but his first concerts were all, all took place in Zimbabwe. Right. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to feature music from uh, from all of that and that whole era, and kind That's of wrap it wrap it around our words and and your sharings, which have just been so important. I think. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank, thank you, you, Tasha. Thank you, Tasha, and thank you, Mark. It's been an absolute guest. I've loved it. Thank you so much for having me. And again, you can uh, listen to this interview. Well, hopefully you're listening on the radio, 100.5 FM, Conscious Living Radio, Co-op Radio in Vancouver. Also available on the YouTube channel, also at www.consciouslivingradio.org. Thanks for joining.